Hi, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this, the first of four resilience guides that I am conducting with the authors of uh, the, the Post Carbon Institute Resilience Guide series. And today we have the author of Power to the People, Greg Paul. Thank you for joining us, Greg. Thanks. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I really enjoyed your book, uh, you know, uh, having directed The End of Suburbia and sort of being on the periphery of the uh, resilience and relocalization movement, uh, I feel like we had a lot of very similar experiences and, and, and followed a very similar path uh, from different perspectives. So sure. I'm, uh, I'm really eager to explore some of that and some of the things that you accomplished and your, your thoughts and experiences. Um, so the name of your book is Power to the People. Could you give us a, uh, a quick overview of uh, what power to the people means and uh, what inspired you to write the book? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, as the title suggests, it's about uh, changing the way that um, we all think about um, energy uh, in general um, from the current uh, large-scale, corporate-dominated, um, centralized model uh, to a more um, localized uh, model that includes um, many uh, locally available renewable energy uh, resources that can be found uh, at the local level. And um, a, a main uh, focus of this uh, new thinking about energy uh, is um, uh, aimed at uh, what is referred to as relocalization, which is uh, strengthening uh, the local economy uh, and relying much more on local resources for um, all of the things that we, we need in our daily lives. But in the case of this book, uh, it's focused on, on energy. Um, could you go over the points as to you know, what problems are facing us and why uh, that led you to, to embrace relocalization? Well, there's a, a lot of uh, interrelated problems, um, especially uh, climate change and what's increasingly referred to as um, extreme weather. Um, I think most climate scientists these days uh, around the world are in agreement uh, that burning fossil fuels, uh, especially coal, uh, oil, and natural gas, uh, along with uh, the problems of deforestation is uh, largely to blame for the rise in carbon dioxide levels um, and that uh, this has raised the temperature of the earth um, by at least one degree uh, within I think the last century and, and it's that that uh, process is accelerating uh, e every day um, Unfortunately, despite all of the talk um, about uh, reducing carbon emissions, um, there was more uh, carbon dioxide um, spewed into the atmosphere within the last few years uh, than at any other time in human history. So uh, this is really um, a significant issue. Uh, this has led to uh, unprecedented fl flooding. Uh, in uh, countries all around the world uh, and also dramatic increases in um, Arctic and Antarctic ice melting as well as um, uh, huge uh, crop failures in many countries uh, around the world and uh, even the Amazon uh, basin has suffered um, several so-called hundred year uh, droughts in the past few years uh, and this is to say nothing about um, the massive fires that we've experienced in this country within the last year or so. So this all adds up to a really troubling picture uh, of global climate destabilization uh, on a really massive scale. And uh, that's big trouble for the economy and everybody who depends on it. And it's big trouble for, um, for the energy grid and for communities that are vulnerable to disruptions in energy, which is why you included that in your list. Yes, yeah, of course. Um, we, we're entering what uh, many people are beginning to refer to now as uh, extreme energy. Uh, the peaking of global oil 
uh, production is a huge threat um, because our modern global economy is almost totally uh, dependent on still somewhat uh, relatively cheap oil uh, and also a wide range of petroleum-based products. Um, peak, the peaking of oil production uh, occurs when uh, the all-time maximum uh, production uh, of oil uh, takes place. And there's a, a growing consensus around the world um, that this has already occurred uh, and that we are currently sort of bumping along the top of the, uh, the production curve of, of global oil production and about to start to come down uh, on the other side of that, of that curve uh, towards less and less um, supplies being available. Um, even the <clears throat> usually over optimistic. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was talking about the over optimism. The industry's gone on a very strong offensive over the past year to discredit peak oil. So if you read any of the, uh, you know, the, the, the elite press, uh, generally they see it as an issue that's somehow be re being resolved by, you know, non conventional oil production. Can we just talk right. for one moment about what that non-conventional oil production means for North America. Does it buy us, apart from the destruction of the ecology and water tables because of fracking, in the context of the peak oil debate, does that buy us a couple of years at the top of the peak before the decline? Uh, it certainly extends uh, domestic supplies uh, for a period of an indeterminate period of time. There's a broad range of uh, opinions about that. Um, but the key distinction here is between conventional uh, oil and gas sources and, and unconventional sources. And uh, conventional sources have already peaked. Uh, the International um, Energy Agency uh, says that that took place back in 2006. And so what we're talking about now is greater quantities of unconventional oil and gas. And that's what we're really talking about with the shale oil and gas fines and also the tar sands from uh, Alberta. Um, this is all unconventional oil, none of which would be economically feasible or viable uh, if the price of oil wasn't already so high. And the price of oil is already so high because the easy, cheaper, conventional resources are beginning to decline. And that's putting upward price pressure on, um, on oil and gas prices world, worldwide. Uh, but in this, in this continent, in the North America, we do have uh, extensive supplies of shale uh, oil and gas and the, the tar sands as well. But we need to understand that those sources come at a, at a price, not only financial, but also environmental. And we're going to get to a point in the not too distant future where we're going to have to decide whether we're going to um, make use of all those resources or not. If we do, uh, we're sealing our fate in terms of uh, climate destabilization. So it, it's going to be a really difficult choice. And the third, the third thing that you write in your book is, is about you know, uh, uh, the effect on the economy. Uh, as an example of that, before we move on, I just recently sure. heard that the, the growth rate of uh, Brazil, which was around, I think, 7 to 10 percent economic growth rate, has crashed. And mm -hmm. I, I think the reason that was given was high energy prices. So if the Brazilian miracle can be uh, undercut by high energy prices, and you can see that the economic, you know, uh, uh, destabilization that brings, then you know I think we can we can we can see that there is a very strong connection between uh, the price of energy, the price of oil, and uh, economic growth as we understand it now. Yes, absolutely, I agree. Uh, the, uh, all of these things that we've been talking about uh, could ultimately bring the global economy to its knees. Um, the, the higher prices of, of oil and, and, and natural gas are going to lead to increased prices for all the other things that we depend upon. Uh, all of these issues are, are interlinked. You really can't talk about one without talking about the other. So the price for food, the price for just about everything is going to be going up as the price for fossil fuels continues to increase. So it's, it's going to affect everyone 
in many different ways. In some ways that some of us are, can't even really uh, accurately predict because there's always the, the unexpected linkages that we haven't thought of that kick in um, when these sorts of price increases really start to take off. Yeah, that's something you're not going to hear from the uh, the more right wing press because, of course, uh, you know uh, uh, higher energy prices is, is good for their stockholder stockholder portfolios. Right. But, uh, you know the fact that it's going to have on the rest of the economy is is uh, is something that they're not talking about. There's a lot of uh, mistruth and lying going on in the mainstream press. A lot of obfuscation around peak oil. Yeah. Right. Um, so, given that, tell us a bit about the organization that you founded in Vermont. Uh, well, I've founded a number of them, but uh, I think we'll probably focus on uh, uh, the Acorn Network and its spin-off organization, the Acorn Renewable uh, Energy um, Co-op. Um, I came back from a peak oil conference, I think it was in 2005, um, and <clears throat> I was uh, talking to a number of other uh, local uh, friends um, in the Middlebury, Vermont area about uh, the lack of planning for uh, any sort of uh, uh, peak oil ac uh, activities at the, the state level, well, the national level, of course, there was no, no planning. State level, there was very little planning, and at the local level, there was virtually none. And so we got together and we formed what was called the ACORN Network. And ACORN was an acronym that stands for Addison County Relocalization Network. And uh, the um, ACORN Network had uh, three main committees. Um, the local food committee, the local energy committee, and a uh, local money committee. And um, we were very busy uh, working on those, those issues for a number of years. And in uh, let's see, 2008, the ACORN Network uh, Energy Committee decided to uh, spin itself off from its parent organization and form um, a renewable energy co-op, um, which became the uh, ACORN Renewable Energy Cooperative. Um, our first initiative was to help um, Vermonters uh, heat their homes. And this was in, in 2005, no, I'm sorry, 2008. And that was the, the year when oil, international oil prices uh, went through the roof. And there were quite a few people in Vermont who were wondering how they were going to be able to afford to uh, heat their homes that winter. And we decided to import a bunch of wood pellets um, to, to help people shift away from heating their homes uh, with oil to using um, wood pellets. So that was our first initiative. I think we brought in 67 tons of um, wood pellets in that first, that first um, uh, initiative, and we went on. And so you set up, uh, you set up uh, individual. Uh, you set up individual uh, pellet furnaces in homes, or was it a district plan? Uh, these were individual um, stoves and, and boilers and furnaces. Uh, some people had already um, made the the switch to um, different heating appliances, and, and some of them needed advice as to as to what to do. And we provided the advice, and we provided the uh, the wood pellets as well. It was essentially uh, aggregating orders into one large bulk order. And uh, that, was, that was the beginning. We've, we've subsequently moved into solar hot water, uh, solar PV, um, and a number of other um, more recent uh, initiatives, all based on local renewables. So to help us understand that a bit more, tell us a bit about your book, and if you could uh, go over the four-part structure of your book, explain what those those that structure is, and then sure. uh, you know let's look in a little bit of detail into each one of those sections. Okay, well the the book is divided into four main parts. Um, part one sets the stage uh, for 
what comes um, after that. Uh, it looks at energy uh, and explains our current um, reliance on non-renewable uh, energy and offers suggestions for um, a variety of local alternatives. Uh, part two of the book uh, focuses on building individual uh, energy resilience and offers guidance and strategies <coughs> uh, on, excuse me, <coughs> Um, just like uh, Marco Rubio. <laughs> uh, it offers guidance um, on strategies and programs that will help people um, become more energy uh, resilient. Part three uh, focuses on building community uh, energy resilience um, and also contains the uh, many case studies from across the country um, that uh, are used to show uh, different successful uh, projects uh, in, in various communities. And then part four of the book essentially is, is a call to action and um, encourages people to get involved. So before we go into section one, could you explain to us um, what what is resilience to people who aren't read in this in the way that the localization movement is using resilience, we think of people being resilient, overcoming adversity, and and surviving. Could you um, could you go into what uh, what resilience means sure, to you? Sure. Sure. Um, well, resilience means uh, the ability of a person uh, or a community to adapt uh, to changing and uncertain circumstances, and we're certainly going to be uh, coming across a lot of those uh, in the years ahead. Um, we need to build uh, greater resilience at the local level, both individually uh, and collectively, so that we will be able to respond uh, to a wide range of <clears throat> energy, food, and uh, economic problems that we're, that we're going to have to deal with. And in many cases, we're going to be dealing with these issues simultaneously, which is going to make it all that more challenging. Um, Renewable energy unquestionably uh, lends itself to a decentralized system uh, of power generation uh, and also ownership. And it also increases um, local energy resilience. Uh, and greater energy resilience means that um, we are not hopelessly dependent on a single, uh, usually centralized source uh, of energy. Uh, we need alternatives. Uh, and local energy production um, capability is an important part of um, community resilience. So um, let's look at what you're thinking in section one. What forms of, uh, of energy are, um, you know, are, are available and what sort of non-renewable strategies uh, can communities pursue? Um, well, let's see. I guess you're right that uh, our current dependence, you're right that our current dependence on on you know uh, centralized energy, non-renewable energy, is right, unsustainable. Right, right, and um, those energy sources are are what we currently uh, use to power our homes and businesses. Uh, and the entire economy. Um, this really shows why we are um, dangerously dependent on, on these resources, uh, which are basically from the 20th century. And we're already, already into the 21st century. Uh, and many of those assumptions about uh, energy really no longer apply. And so, you know, that's really what, what this, um, this book is all about. It's um, looking at our current reality with, um, you know, 21st century um, strategies that are going to help to um, wean us from our current over-dependence on, on fossil fuels. Um, so, so let's start with... Um with one central concept that I think, before we, we go on, 
uh, that I think a lot of people don't understand, and certainly the mainstream okay. press doesn't understand, which is the concept of energy return on energy invested. Why? What is that, and why is it so important to understand that? Right. Um, see if I can explain this in a way that's easy to understand. Um, If you use one BTU of energy um, to produce, say, three BTUs worth of biodiesel, for example, um, it would be expressed as a ratio of uh, three to one. So you're putting in one, one unit of energy to get three units of biodiesel energy back. And that's a, um, a positive energy return on energy invested. If that uh, same BTU of energy um, only yielded less than one BTU, say uh, 0.5 um, BTUs comes out after you put in uh, a whole BTU, uh, that ends up being uh, an energy sink or a, a negative um, energy return on investment. So you're, you're Basically, you're expending more energy to produce the energy, and then you're actually getting back from the energy that you've produced. Uh, and hydrogen is a really good example of that because it has a, a negative return. Uh, I think it's something like uh, 0 0.5 um, units of, of hydrogen out for every one BTU of, of energy that you put in to make to make the hydrogen. So, um, different. Um, let's see. Somebody should have explained that to Governor Schwarzenegger about 10 years ago. Right. right. Well, this is really important, as you said, because um, different forms of energy have different uh, energy return and energy invested. Um, conventional uh, natural gas uh, ranges from 15 to 1 to 20 to 1. So you can see that natural gas uh, is a very potent uh, energy. Um, put in relatively small amounts of energy to get it back, to get fairly large quantities back. Uh, coal is even is even greater, 40 to 1, up to 80 to 1, which is why coal is, is so attractive as a fuel from an energy standpoint, if not from an environmental standpoint. Um, wind power can have some really impressive um, returns, 20 to 1, 40 to 1. Um, despite the imprecise nature uh, of these figures, the general ratios are really useful when you're comparing uh, one energy uh, source from another and really useful to make sure that you're not wasting your time and money uh, producing an energy that uh, really isn't cost effective. And I think you could probably make the case that uh, corn-based ethanol, which has a very low um, energy return on energy invested around one point. I think it's 1.4, 1.5 for every unit that you put in, means that you're really not getting all that much back out uh, in, in terms of, of, of energy. And there's a lot of other environmental issues involved as well. So it really helps inform yeah, like long food crops, crops for. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you have, before we move on, do you have a, a, a favorite renewable energy that, that has the, a good energy return on investment and a positive impact on a community? Is there, is there any one that you kind of favor? Well, that's a hard question to answer because it depends on what um, renewable energy resources are available in that community. So obviously, if you don't have a, a good hydro uh, resource, it makes no sense to pursue hydro. Um, I guess in terms of um, environmental impact and um, the ease of getting the project approved through the regulatory and approval process that uh, community solar projects are looking very attractive these days. And that's why there's so much activity going on across the country uh, in that sector. There's a lot of people who are opposed to wind on aesthetic and other grounds. Um, there's quite a bit of opposition to um, large-scale biomass projects because of uh, air pollution and uh, forestry um, issues. But um, 
Community solar is kind of the sweet spot right now, and it's, it's one of the easiest um, in all aspects. So um, just skipping quickly past uh, your second section, which is about uh, individual resilience, as, as right. we're talking about this, let's get into your third section, which is community energy resilience. It continues on the theme we're talking about, energy return, and, uh, and different options and alternatives for each community. You know, you were talking about wind. And here in Ontario, we have the Green Energy Act, which mandates a feed-in tariff, a fit for uh, renewable projects all across the province. It's been wonderful mm -hmm. in, in spring um, renewable energy across the province. Uh, it ran into problems near Toronto. Uh, Prince Edward County is an island in Lake Ontario and, you know, sees itself quite apart from other communities because it's an island. There was a plan to put in a couple of hundred very large wind turbines and the community went uh, ballistic. Uh, mm -hmm. I did an interview with Buzz Holling who, who came up with the uh, ecological resilience concept back in the 1970s which led to resilience and he was, he was actually quite against the, the renewable energy plan because it was a provincial or a state government imposing uh, you know, uh, taking resources from a community and giving nothing back. So yeah. it's very important that these renewable energy projects be uh, in, have a community investment and a community benefit. That's right. the first part of your third section. Could you comment on that? Well, there, there are really four key principles uh, that I believe should be involved in all community energy initiatives. Uh, the first is uh, community ownership and community benefit. Uh, and in this case, uh, public engagement from the community is really um, crucial. Uh, conventional energy businesses uh, must put profits first. Uh, most community energy projects, uh, on the other hand, put the community first. So there's a really fundamental difference right there. And um, local ownership uh, is really the key uh, to all of that. Um, I think the second really important aspect for a community energy project is that it be uh, renewable, local, and distributed. Um, renewables aren't going to run out, um, and so they are really ideal for um, building local, uh, local energy security. Um, renewables are generally available over uh, a wide geographic area. And that makes um, these types of energy systems more resilient. Uh, and that's thanks largely to its uh, distributed nature. And then the third really important uh, aspect is what I call adapt <coughs> excuse me, adaptive resilience. Um, and that's the ability to um, adapt to changing conditions uh, over time, and that's really essential. Um, and if it's done right, um, community energy initiatives uh, are less vulnerable to external shocks uh, and more able to adapt to uh, changing conditions. And one thing we can probably count on as we move forward uh, are changing conditions. And then finally, <clears throat> the fourth really important uh, aspect of this uh, is um, conservation uh, first, uh, transitioning from living um, to more localized renewable resources uh, is going to require a certain amount of cutback of excess consumption. But uh, I think as most Europeans especially already know, it's quite possible to um, live a very um, comfortable life um, with considerably less consumption. Uh, Europeans um, uh, make do with, with uh, quite a bit less energy consumption than, than most of us in North America do. So those are the four uh, key elements that I think are really important for any community energy project, whatever it may be. I think one of the reasons that, that Europe uh, is successful with, with you know, uh, conservation and, and limiting energy use is, is actually the density of their communities in North America, 
we have sprawling bungalow houses and, and big lots and, and so getting energy out and, and the use of energy is much higher. In Europe, I mean houses tend to be a bit smaller or considerably smaller, but they're also sharing a lot more resources. In my work doing documentaries, I'm looking at how uh, urbanism, urban planning can help with, with you know, issues like uh, uh, energy resilience and, and uh, social resilience. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the whole uh, urbanism and the urban density uh, is, is a big issue in, in regards to energy efficiency and renewable energies. But we were talking about Europe, so I'm going to try to pronounce this German word, Stromein Speisengesetz. So the Germans have a word for everything, and Stromen Speisengesetz. <laughs> what, what does that mean? <laughs> well, it's it's basically uh, very roughly translated um, would be uh, let's see power. Um, uh, what's uh, I'm not going to be able to tran translate it directly for you, but it, it's it refers to what's known as a, a feed-in tariff, um, and a feed-in tariff um, is a policy mechanism that's designed to encourage investment <clears throat> in renewable energy um, and, and those related technologies um, that generate electricity. This, so this refers to electric generation. Um, this is accomplished by guaranteeing uh, grid access uh, and offering long-term contracts um, to renewable energy producers, which can include um, homeowners, uh, businesses, um, farmers, uh, institutions, private investors, wide range, wide range of possible um, people that might be involved in these projects. The, um, the prices offered by these contracts um, normally vary depending on which renewable energy technology you're talking about. Um, and they, they often decrease uh, in the amount that they pay over time. Uh, to encourage um, uh, improvements in the technology. The um, German feed-in tariff, um, whatever the, the word is, um, was one of the first of, of these tariffs and um, also one of the best. Uh, Germany, France, um, Spain, and Ontario uh, now have some of the, uh, the best feed-in tariffs uh, in the world, and these are now generally referred to as uh, advanced renewable tariffs uh, to distinguish them from some of the earlier, uh, simpler uh, versions. And I think it's, it's really important to understand that <clears throat> the, it took the Germans about 10 years uh, from the time they first introduced the, the first feed-in tariff uh, to the time when they actually got it right. So it usually takes a number of years uh, to see how they work and then to amend them as needed. And I think that's also been the case in Ontario, as I recall. Yes, there were, there were big problems around, like I said, the community ownership element of this. You know, this is, this is the big danger when we're looking at um, uh, energy resilience is, is the pushback, the nimbyism from communities that are you know, um, perceive, I think rightly sometimes, that their resources, whether it be wind or, or whatever, are being taken from the, the community in a time where other services are being withdrawn too. You know, in Ontario, they're cutting back hospitals and schools and there's an austerity budget like there is in right. the United States and everywhere else. So from my experience and I think from your experiences, if there's no community participation, ownership and buy-in, then, you know, the, the pushback from communities is going to prevent a lot of great yeah, absolutely. projects. That, that's why it's so important uh, to involve as many local people as possible, as early as possible, uh, in all of these projects. Because um, once they realize that this project is going to benefit the entire community rather than some you know, out-of-state investors, um, it makes a huge difference. Uh, so that, I'm convinced that that's, that's the way the process ideally 
um, should be conducted. It's to get as much local um, input and, and participation as possible uh, right from the beginning. Thank you very much, Greg Paul. And um, uh, for those of you who are watching, you can get uh, a lot of detailed information about, uh, about this and specific projects across the United States and around the world out of Greg's book. I found it endlessly um, helpful. And I really wish that it had been there when I was shooting The End of Suburbia or Escape from Suburbia. I could have made uh, some, some much better films, perhaps, having had that, uh, that access to different communities and different community projects that are so successful. So thank you very much. Uh, the book is available from Chelsea Green and the Post Carbon Institute. And I'm Greg Green saying goodbye. And thank you. It's thank been you a pleasure. Paul.